Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here, and today I'm going to be covering chapter two. I will give a wrap up and uh, give some highlights of chapter one, which was titled Globalization. And that chapter is a staple in international business courses. The last book that we used by Wild and Wild the first chapter was also globalization. And so it is one of these terms that you hear a lot about because of the trends that we see happening around the globe in terms of business, trade, and commerce. And it's um, still a controversial topic. I share with you an article that was authored by Theodore Levitt uh, of Harvard University he published the article in Harvard Business Review in May, June issue of 1983. And he ignited a debate as to whether companies can realistically standardize their products. So he talked about standardizing the markets and standardizing production. And that goes along with what I showed to you on Tuesday this idea of globalization of markets and globalization of production. So this topic is still controversial. People take various sides of globalization. There have been all kinds of books written on the upside of globalization and the downsides. And one important factor of globalization besides technology, which you'll read in chapter one, were the organizations that became, I guess you can say, catalysts of this globalization trend. And those four organizations that I included on the slide that I showed on Tuesday were the IMF and the World Bank were founded in 1944 in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. And these organizations were to provide stability to the global economic environment that had been destroyed as a result of the war. Now, there was also the uh, GATT organization, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which was founded in 1947. And in 1995, it became the WTO, also known as the World Trade Organization. This organization was to serve as the arbiter of trade disputes, or the referee, if you will, of trade disputes. And it has changed its focus over the years to look at issues of intellectual property that has become more prevalent because of this digital age that we're in. And so the WTO resolve disputes as well. If there's, for example, a copyright issue, Microsoft years ago filed a complaint with the WTO against China because they asserted that they were losing billions of dollars because China was allowing its citizens to copyright its software. Uh, indeed was true. They found that out of all of the copies that were loaded on computers in China, 99% of those copies were not authentic. They were not authentic copies. They were, they were uh, bootlegged. And so they sued um, for damages, actually. And what happened was that uh, China had to show that their regulations were being put in place to prevent this uh, uh, piracy that was that was occurring. So the WTO resolves these uh, disputes. Uh, it mediates between countries and it serves to ensure that free trade is going to be the mantra to allow this flow of goods to uh, to flourish. Now, the organization they did not mention was the, the United Nations, which I mentioned to you. 
Uh, this is also a very important organization. It's not mentioned until later in the book, but it's, a, it's indeed a very important organization. Service more as a peacekeeping body to prevent the scourge of war that had occurred twice in the 20th century. We're talking about World War I, World War II. And these um, organizations help shape the legal and regulatory framework for trade and uh, other activities. Now, again, we're in a digital age. And if you go to page 20, they talk about the digital generation, the expanding global use of information technology. You have something called diffusion of technology. Technological know-how and ingenuity has spread. No longer is the U.S. the leader in the production of innovation. Other nations have stepped forward, South Korea, China, and, and even India to a degree in terms of their engineering uh, prowess. So also in chapter one, they talk about this globalization controversy, which I broke down in the slide, this slide here. So you have arguments for and against globalization. And this is a fierce debate. And again, books have been written about these topics. And in the book, they also weigh in on this debate. And they actually label the section the globalization controversy. And they say to its fiercest critics, globalization, the impact of an increasingly free flow of ideas, people, goods, services, and capital that leads to closer integration and independence of economies and societies can be a force for exploitation and injustice. Some socialist leaning citizens and labor unions believe that capitalism exploits man in the economic sense just as communism exploits man in the political sense. Well, I don't know if I quite agree with the way it was put here because I don't think it's, it's um, merely socialist nations or socialist individuals that believe that this system is exploitive. Uh, there are many different bodies that uh, and even nations that are not communist or not socialist that believe that it's ex exploitative and also believe that the IMF and the World Bank play a role in this exploitation. So you have all of these issues uh, surrounding globalization and they go on and they talk about this idea of um, making globalization work for all. And that is another section and I must say we'll we'll watch a video called life and debt it's a case study of Jamaica and when you watch that video you will see globalization not on paper not in theory but you will see globalization in actuality at work and you will see how some nations struggle in terms of being a part of this global economy. And so globalization is one of those topics that uh, has some longevity and uh, it still is a, a topic that people talk about, write books, write scholarly papers on. And I have also been a part of this debate. I have, in the last announcement that I posted, I made mention of a a presentation that I gave. Uh, I was invited to Clark Atlanta University, my alma mater in 2007, to serve on a panel. And the topic was about globalization. And so I spoke on the topic. And I provided a link. So if you want to listen to that presentation that I gave, it's only about 12, 13 minutes. I believe you'll appreciate it because I talk about all the things that I have mentioned in class before. I talked about some of the ways globalization can be viewed, various ways that it can be viewed. Uh, you have 
the idea of, of obviously globalization from a business standpoint, from a political standpoint, from a cultural standpoint. We just talked about globalization of technology, which is a big driver for this economic, um, the, the increasing velocity of trade. So you have a, a, a lot of uh, issues, um, but I would like to share with you a quick video. This is a video that I found last semester and I share it with the class. And it is titled Globalization Explained in One Minute. And it basically gives you a animated sense of uh, or animated depiction of globalization. And I think it does a fairly good job. So let's take a look. The concept of globalization and the potential benefits aren't hard to understand. By eliminating trade barriers in an honest manner, everyone could theoretically win. One, poor countries would receive a significant influx of capital as international companies take advantage of the lower wages and in time, this could even lead to a gradual eradication of poverty. Two, those who live in rich countries can take advantage of greater product variety as well as better prices thanks to imports. Three. The world would move towards a more efficient allocation of capital, based on whatever it is each country can produce better than others. If a country cannot produce, let's say, clothing in a cost-effective manner, it can simply import clothes and focus on the products it's better at making. Unfortunately, things haven't exactly gone as planned for several reasons. One, most countries don't practice what they preach when it comes to being fair. For example, Rich countries, which encourage poorer countries to sell them resources, but discourage them from selling actual high-value added products. 2. Everyone wants to game the system by artificially weakening their currency to boost exports, subsidizing industries, and so on. 3. Whenever something's wrong with the economy, local politicians and citizens love blaming globalization. It sure beats looking in the mirror. The end result is that more and more people claim globalization doesn't work. However, is what we have today truly globalization or just one big masquerade? So there you have it. You have a thumbnail sketch of globalization. And you saw some of the arguments there dealing with the um, dichotomy, if I can use the word dichotomy, which basically means that something is divided you have two sides. Uh, in this sense, you're talking about developed nations versus developing nations having a, a kind of having this debate about what's fair. And so the whole system of, of trade has been evolving over time. And you have some new countries that are rising. What you're seeing now in the last, I would say, 50 to 70 years, so we're talking about 1950, when the U.S. was riding a wave of prosperity after World War II, it was the superpower or it was the industrialized nation that was left standing and practically uns unscathed because there were, there were no bombs, um, dropped on the mainland, there was no uh, basically combat that that happened uh, here in the United States, whereas Europe was practically destroyed. So the U.S. came out as the leader uh, economically uh, and also in terms of, of their, their stability. And what happened in the 1950s is the U.S. again rode a wave of prosperity and they begin to consume. You had this whole idea of the middle class family, particularly white families with two parent families, a dog, a picket fence, and two kids. That was just kind of the, the picture of what the ideal family was. And so you go to, through the 60s and of course, you had all the protests and civil rights uh, that occurred. Many different organizations were involved. Uh, we mostly hear Dr. King, but there were many other organizations that were also involved in fighting for rights. Many did it in different ways, but it was this uh, surge of protest movements 
from different angles that uh, forced the United States to look at things quite differently uh, or be embarrassed in terms of their status in the world, in terms of their, their, moral, their moral authority. But this idea of trade has evolved over time and chapter two talks about the evolution of international business. And after we take a, a quick break, we're going to come back to it. Okay, so let's talk about trade. What is trade? Trade is what's considered to be or should be a positive so that both sides benefit. So in the old days of barter, you had two parties, at, at least two. If you had something that someone wanted and they had something that you needed, then you trade. And all that was left to determine was what? The terms of trade. You have to determine what is equal, what amount of the good you're trading is equal to the amount of goods that you want. So, for example, if you have two bushels of pineapples, you negotiate with someone who has mangoes and you're going to trade pineapples for mangoes. But you have to decide what the terms of trade are. How many bushels of mangoes can I get for my two bushels of pineapples? Maybe it's three. Maybe you get three bushels of mangoes for two bushels of pineapples. There are all sorts of, of um, theories where you have to you have to figure in the cost of production uh, producing these goods to determine the terms of trade. But of course, we can agree that trade is good because you don't always have everything you need and you have to find partners that will trade what they're good at producing as the the animation uh, stated the. Um, the video that we just watched stated, there's a kind of specialization that takes place around the world where countries have been endowed with different types of resources, whether it be gold, diamonds, bauxite, which is used to make aluminum, copper, iron ore, or it can be agricultural products like cocoa, coffee, cotton, um, um, uh, cement, um, sugar cane, coffee, you know, all of these products. Uh, it is ironic, and I'll say this, it's kind of surprising. It is ironic that the United States is one of the leading producing countries of bananas. Okay? So in the United States, where are bananas grown? Think about it. And you may be scratching your head because you may realize that there, there are no banana plantations in the United States. So how is it that America is the leading producer of bananas? Well, those bananas are grown in Latin America. The companies Chiquita, Dole, and Del Monte have use the land in South America to produce their bananas. They own the plantations and they hire the workers. And thus, those companies are able to produce cheaply and they're able to produce at scale and control 95% of the banana, world's banana market. So these countries that produce these items and they have been blessed with having uh, petroleum underneath the earth where they are and there's a great need for petroleum because you make thousands of, of different products and so you get into a situation where countries trade for what they need and they uh, export the goods that uh, they're able to make or produce so that's how that's what trade is and you have a situation where countries that are wealthy and that can make industrial products have an advantage 
not only are they more industrial, they can make more products and their products, the industrial products or the finished goods tend to hold their value a lot better than commodities. Commodities have a tendency to fluctuate because of many external conditions, including the weather, whether it's wet, whether it's uh, humid, whether you have locusts, like they had a locust, a swarm of locusts that was going around in East Africa, and I think it uh, went up in India as well, uh, or things such as drought, which could severely hamper uh, one's um, season you know, in terms of being able to harvest your crop. Uh, diseases, you know, are also another issue. So you have all of these things that affect the market for commodities or agricultural products. So those products fluctuate more in value, which means that developing nations, which mostly produce those products, are at a risk. And I pose the question that it is developing nations, poor nations, that have most of the resources. All of the resources that I mentioned just a minute ago, those are in abundance when you look at developing nations, but they're poor. Richer nations have fewer resources, but they're rich. So how did that happen? One may say, perhaps that's the exploitation that they're talking about with globalization. Now, I do take issue in the book where the authors had mentioned one of the reasons that these countries are having problems is because, and I quote, countries that fall under this category of losers, globalization losers, include those that do not provide economic and political freedoms to their citizens. Most of these countries are governed by authoritarian regimes with minimum rule of law and insignificant transparency. They include Central Asia, much of Africa, and countries such as North, North Korea. Okay, I kind of take issue with that. That's, that's a bit simplistic. Uh, in my view, it's, it's simplistic to just say that that is the only reason that globalization um, is not working for countries. Because what is happening, folks, today is that countries like the United States also believe that globalization is not working. Uh, more recently, you, you hear a lot of this bickering about trade and the fact that China is playing unfairly. Now, bear in mind that Western nations, including the United States, have had hundreds, uh, hundreds of years of a head start. But now when countries begin to figure it out, like China, now they have an issue with globalization. Everybody's talking about we need to tear up trade agreements. And so it, it's, it, it's a very interesting turn of events here in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Now that these other countries like Japan and China and, and Brazil... Uh, in India have started to gain a level of prosperity. So what happens is that in this balance of power that has the United States at the top in Europe amongst those rich nations, you're having other nations breaking through and it's crowded. It becomes crowded. So everybody can't remain at the top. So then what happens is you basically change the rules. But going back to the theories of international trade, I mentioned that the, the, one of the basic forms of trade is barter. You find someone who has what you need and you would hope that you have what they want. So then you figure out the terms of trade and you're happy. But that works but it's clumsy because you have to find the exact condition. Otherwise, one side will not be happy. You'll have what's called a zero-sum game instead of a positive-sum game. And, of course, trade is based on it's based on e e equal exchanges. And it's not always barred. Of course, you, you trade um, credits, inflows and outflows, and that has to do with uh, currency, exchanging of currency for goods. Um, there are other forms of trade as well. But let's get into some of the theories. 
So you have this uh, idea of mercantilism, which occurred in the 15th century. You may remember Columbus, who we all let, hear about Christopher Columbus, uh, Cristobal Colombo, which is was his name, uh, was actually commissioned by the king and queen of Spain to discover the new world. And I believe he was actually born in Italy, but he was one of the navigators or one of the, I guess, explorers who actually wanted to seek economic fortune. And while Columbus was lost, actually, when he found the Western Hemisphere in the West Indies, which is now called the West Indies, he saw these Arawak Indians and they resemble the people that he heard about from previous explorers. Those explorers were actually talking about India, which is the Indian subcontinent, where, of course, the people are very dark um, in complexion, swarthy, and have the, these, these fine features. When he went over to what is now the Caribbean, he saw similar people, and he thought that this must be the place that they're talking about. Not realizing, if you look at a map, he was way off. India is in Asia. The Caribbean is, you're talking, 10,000 miles apart. And, and so that was, um, that was kind of an interesting um, a story that Columbus was actually lost. And you know, he never set foot in the United States. They say he discovered America, which means he just saw it. There were already natives here, and he never set foot here. But uh, certainly he let, kind of led the way to this um, Spanish uh, expansion uh, to go around looking for trade opportunities. So mercantilism was an era where they went around, they set sail to the, the oceans, and they stopped at places uh, such as... Um, the Portuguese also were naval superpowers. Cape Verde, Equatorial Guinea, which is in the crook of, of the African continent where they speak Spanish, actually. The Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, in the su southernmost point. Then they would go to Madagascar, Mauritius, and those islands for spices. Then they would go to the Indian subcontinent and then to China. So that is a long route that they took in order to trade goods that they did not have, things like spices, things like uh, leather, silk, incense, uh, cowrie shells, which was at one point used as currency, and even human cargo so, as slaves. Yeah, these were all things that were traded. And of course, the transatlantic slave trade is a part of that history. And so that was mercantilism. That was 15th century. And then in the 18th century, or more specifically, 1776, Adam Smith came up with this theory of specialization that if, in fact, you have a specialty in something and someone else has a specialty in something, then you will engage in specialization, uh, which means that me as a producer... Let's say I'm producing two items only, but I produce one better than the other. Now, let's say I find a trading partner. That trading partner produces the same items that I produce. But the one that I don't produce well, they produce excellently. And the one that I produce well, they don't produce well at all. So the theory is that why should I use any of my resources producing something that I don't produce well? Why don't I specialize at what I do best? You specialize in what you do best, or at least better than me, and then we expand our output and then we trade. That's the way that theory works. That is the theory of absolute advantage. It's a specialization. You can think of it on, on the level of having a roommate splitting the chores. 
somebody does one chore better than the other person instead of that roommate doing both chores and one of them poorly and you're you doing both chores and doing one of them poorly then you do one chore for everybody and this other person does that chore for everybody that particular chore because they do it better and then you save time and so that's the concept of absolute advantage comparative advantage is a little different because here in this situation let's say you have these uh, two tasks that you're doing and you have a roommate you do both of those tasks better than your roommate but you only do one you do one of them slightly better and you do the other one much better under the theory of comparative advantage this is david ricardo this was a century later 18 well not quite a century but 1817 so actually we're only talking about 50 years later 40 50 years later that he had the opinion that you can still benefit from trade even if you're better at both tasks better than your partner at both tasks and you should still concentrate on that which you do best and leave the other task to the other party that you can also gain a, an increased output so they talk about uh, they explain it in greater detail in the book and and how it works uh, they also talk about the uh, the assumptions in economics you always talk about assumptions and they um, have a case in here of Brazil US the assumption is that you have two countries producing two products now we know that there are more than 180 countries producing thousands of products so this doesn't quite fit but it is certainly how countries uh, trade today. They, they look at uh, specialties. They look at specialization. When you talk about specialties, you talk about Egyptian cotton. You may talk about Kenyan coffee. You may talk about uh, Madagascar vanilla. You may uh, talk about uh, steel from Zambia or Chilean steel. You may talk about Nigerian sweet crude oil. So you have all of these specialties these countries have established over time. And they see an advantage of specializing as opposed to spreading them their resources thin and producing those items which they don't do efficiently. If you remember economics, the production possibility curve. And this production possibility curve that I have on the slide here shows you that you have resources, a finite amount of resources, and you can use those resources to produce combinations of things. But there's a trade-off. There's an opportunity cost. For each unit that you trade or each unit that you give up producing one thing, you gain in the other. So there's a sliding scale. Uh, for example, if I'm producing, uh, in this, the book gives uh, the case of coffee and corn. Now, I can produce coffee and corn as a farmer, but I might produce more of one thing than the other. Or the extreme case is I can produce all corn or all coffee, right? Or any combination in between. That's the production possibility curve. Now, there are exceptions uh, to the rule. There is a, um, before I get to the exception, there's a factor endowment theory. Uh, two Sw Swedish economists, Eli Heckscher and Bertil Olin, refined David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage and showed that nations primarily export goods and services that intensely use their abundant factors of production. So your abundant Factors of production are things like land, labor, and capital. You probably remember that also from economics. Uh, and also they include entrepreneurship in some models. Each country has a varying amount of factors of production. Uh, we talk about labor, 
Now, that is both quantity of labor and quality of labor. Land, quantity of land in terms of the amount of space you have, and quality of land. Is it fertile? Do you have fertile ground? Uh, are you an agricultural nation? Uh, do you rely on exports uh, of these commodities? And then we talk about capital. Well, what is capital? Is it just money? Or is it factors of production in terms of the equipment that you need in order to produce? So we're talking about machinery and equipment and other things that you need to produce. Um, so this theory, the heckscher olin theory, states that if, if you have an abundance of labor, you should produce labor-intensive goods. If you have an abundance of capital, you produce capital-intensive goods. If you have um, a lot of land, you should produce land-intensive goods. So that's the way the theory goes. Now, there is, um, well, that's the factor endowment theory. Now, the, there is a... Um, they don't mention in the book. That's surprising. And I, I looked at the book, but they, they don't mention the Leontief Paradox, uh, which is in some books will be presented as a, an alternative way of looking at this. Some countries have an abundance of certain resources. For example, the United States is a capital intensive country that no longer produces a lot of manufactured goods. It's a service oriented economy. But one of the things that it does export a lot of are land intensive products. And I'm talking about agriculture. So uh, that is a paradox. You have a capital intensive country, very wealthy, but it's a very powerful agricultural nation. So that is called the Leontief Paradox. That is not in the book, but that is something that uh, you should keep in mind. They also talk about the Porter's Diamond model of national competitive advantage. So countries have advantages when you talk about the quality of factor conditions, uh, whether they have an, a, a good technological infrastructure whether they have a bustling economy, whether they, they have quality labor, skilled labor, highly educated uh, uh, citizens, whether they have the infrastructure. And all of these things provide the best factor conditions for production. And then demand conditions, they mentioned. This is page 44. They, uh, a, a very stable economy one that is not susceptible to, to uh, external shocks. And that is done by um, manipulations. You can manipulate the economy, adjusting the interest rates and raising taxes, lowering taxes to stimulate demand and to also to reel in demand if there is uh, inflation. So you have all of these different uh, factors uh, that, in, that have an impact uh, when we talk about production. America consumes a lot. We are, or this country is, the largest debtor nation. D-E-B-T-O-R, debt, debtor, debtor nation. And that's because we spend a lot of money on things mostly... Uh, I won't say mostly, but we spend a lot of money on things we don't need. And we, co we consume more than we need. Not that we don't need the things that we consume, but those things that we consume, like food, we consume much more than we need. Um, I, re I once read an article, and in this article, it was, it was titled, What is Your Consumption Factor? And the article was talking about the consumption of Americans, and it stated that one American consumes the equivalent of seven Kenyans. And I have friends that are Kenyans, and I thought about that. So one American consumes the same amount as seven Kenyans. 
and you begin to uh, reevaluate how you think about um, consumption habits in the United States. I mean, it is it, it's amazing when you look at how much we consume and how much we waste in this country. It's it, it's amazing. But again, you have the type of society that is made to uh, support this type of consumption, but I don't believe it's sustainable. Uh, some of the things, the debates you're hearing now about sustainable sustainability. Uh, also, uh, when we talk about the environment, at the end of chapter one, they talk about biofuels, a case of sustainable development and energy security. So everybody's talking about this issue now. And it is certainly worth uh, a conversation worth having. So looking at trade policy, as I begin to wind down, we're at the, about a 40 minute mark and this chapter is almost done. Uh, this new book is, is uh, a lot different. Um, I'm still filling it out, but it's, it's uh, very different. This chapter is, this, this chapter in our last book was chapter five. And I'm finding that this book doesn't cover in the same way, uh, but it still covers the material, but it's uh, in a different way. Uh, and the professor is always going to have certain issues and preferences of one, uh, how something is covered in one book over the other. But this idea of trade policy, all government actions that seek to alter the size of merchandise and or service flows from and to a country. Now, why would they do that? So you have the issue of what's called protectionism, which they, I don't think they use that word. And you know what? They should use that word. They should use the word protectionism because that's what it's called. And it is this idea that I'm still looking for the word. They don't have protectionism in the book, uh, which is not good. But protectionism is this way that a country uh, not only wants to stem the flow of trade because they may have an infant industry, they may have an industry that's young and they want to protect it from a flood of imports. But tariffs are also used to raise revenue, frankly. And uh, it is also a, a way of uh, ensuring that competition is fair. Uh, or let's put it this way, that your local manufacturers is, is, is going to have a, a fair, uh, they're going to have a, a fair chance at succeeding against foreign competition. So you have the tariffs which are taxes. You have preferential duties, which may come uh, in the form of a, a, a trading group like the European Union or the, um, the East African uh, community or Mercosur or uh, ASEAN group. These are all regional groupings where you have preferential uh, duties. Um, low duties and some in some regions we talk about the the uh, what used to be called the North American Free Trade Agreement which is now the US Mexico and Canada agree trade agreement not a very creative name but that's what it's called and you have this MFN most favored nation status which is given to those nations uh, which uh, are is going to be provided with certain benefits and tax breaks. And certainly there may be complaints uh, from some nations that um, this may 
be stepping over the line in terms of giving preferential treatment. Uh, I mentioned the 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 uh, Banana Gate case. It was called Banana Gate in, in the day, but there have been other kinds of disputes in terms of these uh, preferential um, treatments. Then you have non-tariff barriers. What are non-tariff barriers? If tariff barriers are taxes, then non-tariff tariff barriers are those things that may be put as a barrier, but don't involve funds, don't involve taxes. Things like quality requirements, things uh, like uh, sanitation requirements, um, quality control, you have to go through inspection. There might be administrative delays of getting paperwork through. All types of these barriers that essentially are used uh, in a way to deter or to to even in some ways frustrate the uh, those wanting to bring goods into the country. Uh, quite quite a number of non-tariff barriers are used to protect local markets. Sometimes it has to do with how, what is the what is the ease of doing business in a country? How long does it take you to get a business license? What is the transparency of the government? Uh, what, are, what are the uh, costs of doing business? And there are rankings. Countries have rankings um, in this as well. But non-tariff barriers certainly are, can, can be an impediment to, to trade. Here are the types of tariffs. And I won't read all of these, but um, lots of lots of different uh, types of tariffs. Subsidy. A subsidy is uh, it is something given by the government to help local companies. So a subsidy can be a tax break. It can be a grant. It can be technical assistance. It can be anything that helps spur or helps to assist local businesses and exports. And that is uh, something that uh, is done in order to boost, uh, boost exports and, and build revenue. Uh, export taxes. Taxes meant to raise export costs and divert production for home consumption. Uh, there is a concept called import substitution where... You produce goods at home, even though it's more expensive to do that, because you're trying to uh, you're trying to cut down on your export, uh, on your import, uh, your actual import expenses, and by producing things uh, locally. You have other things uh, mentioned here: counter trade, which is really a modern day barter. In counter trade, an export of goods or services to one country commits to import goods or services of a corresponding value from that country. So it's like a barter arrangement, more or less. Export cartels, things like cocoa. Uh, for example, if you go to West Africa, you have two of the largest exporting uh, cocoa exporting countries in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. So they have an, a cartel, and cocoa producing nations have a cartel where they determine the price and flow of cocoa in the market so that you don't have these price shocks. There is a, a group of nations called OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It is comprised of obviously oil producing nations that spread out all over the, the, the world which includes a lot of Middle Eastern countries, but also countries like Indonesia and uh, Venezuela, Nigeria, also a, a part of OPEC. And that is an oil cartel where they control the and regulate the uh, price of that particular commodity. Some of the other modes of protectionism are to protect the health and safety of locals. There was a very tragic case in India that happened in the 70s. It was called the Bhopal 
the the Union Carbide crisis in Bhopal, India, where there was a gas leak, and it blinded and uh, severely maimed uh, people in terms of their respiratory. They were inhaling this poison gas. Uh, a large amount of people died and, and were permanently uh, injured um, from that. And as a result, you had for a couple of decades, I believe, India had closed their country to foreign direct investment. And then finally in 91, they reopened and started this boom that we see today in India in terms of the tech industry. But certainly you have regulatory bodies that make sure that products are safe. The FDA, they're doing this uh, whole vaccine um, exploration and trying to find a vaccine for the coronavirus. And of course, that has to go through a series of trials to make sure that it's safe. Uh, the F, not only the FDA, but you have the USDA, you have the OSHA, which deals with air pollution, uh, at which a foreign company may have to abide by certain rules if they are producing something, a product that emits toxins in the air. And then last but not least, you have embargo. That's the ultimate form of protectionism that a country can uh, put forth against another nation. And there is one such embargo that we, most of us are familiar with, and perhaps all of us. There is an embargo that was imposed by the U.S. on Cuba, which is 90 miles south of Florida. And that embargo has been in place since 1960, I believe. It's right after Castro uh, came to power. And I've been to Cuba, and Cuba is a wonderful country, but there's obviously a, not, a lot of things that it needs, including cement and blacktop to pave the roads, tuck pointing on the buildings and paint and basic things. And the embargo certainly hurts. It certainly hurts Cuba in many different ways. Uh, but many business people here in America are, are waiting for the day where those doors open. That embargo is lifted because they want to get rid of all of those 1950 vintage cars that are on the road, or at least some of them. And, of course, Starbucks will follow. McDonald's will follow. So my advice to you, if you want to go to Cuba, go now. Go when it's Cuba and not something else. Now, after these multinational corporations flood in, it's going to be like any other American city. Um, so go while you can. Cuba is a wonderful place, but it is under the uh, embargo. That does not mean that they are not American products in Cuba because they are. There are American products. So what typically happens, something called gray market goods that may go through Canada. Canada is, uh, has normalized relations with Cuba. Those products go from the U.S. to Canada. Or maybe they're produced in Canada. But then Canada, or a distributor in Canada, sends Coca-Cola to Cuba. And so you go to Cuba, and you see someone drinking a Coca-Cola, and you wonder, how did that happen? I thought we had an embargo. Well, there are workarounds. And then there are also exemptions for certain companies to operate in uh, countries with under sanctions, uh, mostly the very powerful nations. But that's all I'm going to talk about today. That is chapter two. Chapter two is very straightforward. Uh, it's a very interesting chapter. It has a lot in it. Uh, I mentioned a lot of cases and some of those I will supplement with uh, videos. We'll watch a very interesting video on life and debt, the case of Jamaica. There's another one I have called The Other Side of Outsourcing, which talks about globalization and culture and how that has affected India. So I've got quite a number of these videos and I think you'll appreciate them. 
So I will see you on next Tuesday. There will be a quiz, a 10 item quiz immediately after this video. It will be available at the 15 minutes before the end of class. And uh, I wish you well and have a good weekend. Take care.